Kentucky basketball had a bit of a track meet with the Florida Gators, but unfortunately, the Wildcats could not come out on top. You are Locked On Kentucky, your daily podcast on the Kentucky Wildcats, part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. All right, what's going on, Big Blue Nation? Welcome on in to Locked On Kentucky, your daily Kentucky Wildcats podcast. I'm your host, Lance Daw, writer for various SEC-related things. But on this podcast, we take a dive into all things Kentucky athletics. Today's episode is brought to you by FanDuel. You can make every moment more and new customers join today and you'll get $200 in bonus bets if your first bet of $5 or more wins. You can visit FanDuel.com slash locked on to get started. On today's episode of Locked On Kentucky, we are going to be recapping Kentucky's 94 to 91 loss to the Florida Gators in overtime last night in Rupp recording this actually uh, after this game uh, happens here late, uh, late during the evening. Tough one for the Wildcats who could have closed this one out in regulation at a couple of different points, but Unfortunately, 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 they didn't, and so Walter Clayton Jr. was able to hit some shots in the clutch and pull this one out. We're going to talk about the positives, the negatives, uh, and, and kind of look ahead to what the rest of the season may look like because the, what was a promising Kentucky Wildcats team earlier this year that could have been something really special and dominant may have maybe our maybe our expectations need to be adjusted just a little bit. Thank you so much for making Locked On Kentucky your first listen every single day. Want to remind everyone out there that we are free and available on all platforms. And if you're watching on YouTube, please subscribe to the show. If you're listening on podcast, I would appreciate it if you subscribed there as well. So let's go ahead and get into it. First thing I want to note here about this breakdown, we talked in the preview episode about how Florida did not shoot particularly uh, particularly well against the Wildcats. They went 9 of 31 from beyond the arc, but they still hit nine threes. And in this game, Florida hit 12. I said in the preview episode, there's no way Florida gets to nine three-pointers again, right? They don't shoot that well. And so coming into Rupp, my expectation was that they would not shoot that well from beyond the arc. And there were a couple of uh, players that struggled. Will Richard was 2 of 7. Tyree Samuel was 0 of 2. But Walter Clayton Jr., who played 33 minutes in this game, was 7 of 13 from beyond the arc, including the game-tying three to send the contest to overtime. And I believe it was Kugel that hit the uh, really clutch three-pointer, actually, uh, in OT, to kind of keep it to kind of finalize the game in, in, a, in a couple of different ways. Um, but Clayton being able to hit all of those seven three pointers. We'll talk about the negatives first. Let, let's, let's go ahead and get into this. I didn't think this was going to happen. I didn't think Kentucky was going to be outshot from three, both in terms of makes and in terms of attempts, also in terms of percentage. It just normally doesn't happen. Kentucky's one of the best three-point shooting teams in the country, and they were not able to get it done at home. Clayton, in particular, was able to either create space and knock down three-point shots, or Kentucky gave him space, and he was able to hit hit his uh, his attempts. Kentucky's three-point defense has not been terrible this year. In fact, opponents are only shooting 32% from beyond the arc. That's 103rd nationally. That's top third in the country. It's not bad. It's actually a pretty okay statistic. But tonight, their defense just kind of fell apart. And I understand that from a points per game perspective, Kentucky's not getting it done on that end of the floor. And that's what matters at the end of the day. If you don't score more than your opponent, you lose. And the more you let your opponent score, the more difficult it's going to be to win the game. But Kentucky's defense, in terms of adjusted efficiency, and in terms of 
the actual shooting percentages that they're holding their opponents to, it's not that bad. They only dropped five spots in adjusted efficiency after giving up 94 points. I think a lot of this had to do with the fact that they held Florida for the majority of this game without uh, any second chance points. As time was winding down, Florida had zero. So like Kentucky's 12 or 13 second chance points. And then they had nine as things wound down and closed out. I believe a couple in overtime as well. And that's what sealed it. Kentucky was not able to rebound. Florida was able to hit some three-pointers, specifically Walter Clayton Jr. Maybe it's a matchup thing. That's kind of what I'm chalking it up to here today. I think that Florida's got some really good guards. I said this on the preview episode multiple times. Despite being 14-6 and six and 4-3 and three in conference play, this is a good basketball team. This is a coach that I believe in, in Todd Golden. This team has potential. I said that multiple times, that they can be really good if they step up a little bit on defense, or I guess in this case, if they step up a lot on offense. Will Richard, Walter Clayton, Zion Pullen, who also had a really good game and had 21 points. Those are guys that can really go off. Ty, uh, Riley Kugel off the bench. It was only 3 of 11 from the floor, but 2 of 4 from beyond the arc. Hit some clutch shots. Obviously, that one in OT. The defense either has to step up or Kentucky has to make plays, closing things out in regulation. Because we can talk about the fact that, oh, Trey Mitchell went 2 of 10 and 0 of 5. I mean, that, that can't happen. You go starting and going 4 of 11, you know, to have your center go 4 of 11 is not great, but he also had, what, how many blocks? Eight, half a million it felt like. Sometimes you can't have an efficient day. Rob Dillingham going 8, eight of 17. I mean, that's not terribly inefficient, but taking 17 shots. I mean, it, it, there, there are different things that we can talk about with the offense. Overall, I think it was a good day. Dillingham still had 20 points, which was great. Reed Shepard had a great day with 24 points. Antonio Reeves had 19. Um, Hugo still had 13 total points, by the way, and he was 5 of 6 from the charity stripe, which, which is really good to see. I mean, there are certain things we can talk about with the offense. Like, individually but as a whole they scored 91 points you have to be able to capitalize on that you can't allow a team to come into your gym and drop 94 in two periods in overtime you should have closed this thing out in regulation Rob Dillingham missing that free throw and Kentucky's coaches telling these kids uh, not telling these kids I guess I should say to not foul up three was a little confusing. This is something that is pretty common now in college basketball. When you are up by three points, what you should do if the opposing team gets a final shot is foul them before they can put that shot attempt up and put them on the free throw line and make them shoot two free throws because it extends the game gives you an opportunity to extend your lead again if they don't hit both of their free throws and gives you a better opportunity to win instead of completely whiffing on defense. I think it was Shepard. I may be wrong. Completely whiffing on defense. By the way, Shepard played every single minute of this game. Not, not a bad game from Shepard. Not a, not a great one it was an efficient day overall in offense just there were some defensive lapses that this team has that just are not acceptable but man th th this game this is why I, I don't feel like this is necessarily the end of the world Kentucky could have won this game in regulation they could have both these teams had a great contest back and forth affair 29 lead changes 29 lead changes tonight. And he just came out on the wrong end. 66.7% from the foul line. You went 6 of 9. Not nice. Got to be able to clean things up. That's just kind of where we are, I think, at this point with this Kentucky team. Let's talk a little bit more about the details. Let's talk about some of the things that maybe Kentucky can try and fix. 
moving forward. Maybe some of the reasons why this is not all that bad. We're going to dive into that in just a second. Before I do that, though, I want to tell you guys about our friends over at FanDuel. Happy Super Bowl to all who celebrate from FanDuel, America's number one sports book. Because if you're like me, Super Bowl Sunday is all about scoring the best seat on the couch, grabbing your favorite snacks, grabbing some friends, and placing down some super awesome bets. And FanDuel has so many different ways for you to end the season with a W or two or three, because not only can you bet on who will win Super Bowl 58, but FanDuel also has bets for which players will score a touchdown. I'm sure I've got some different guys on the Chiefs that I have in mind. Maybe Isaiah Pacheco. Maybe somebody like Patrick Mahomes just taking it in, in himself. How many points will be scored in this contest? Will this be a high-scoring game? Will this be low-scoring because of how San Fran plays defense? The Chiefs playing pretty good defense against the Ravens just a week or so ago. And so many more different props on top of that. So new customers, join today and you'll get $200 in bonus bets with your first bet of $5 or more wins. Just visit FanDuel.com slash locked on to sign up. Again, that is FanDuel.com slash locked on. You can make every moment more with FanDuel, an official partner of the NFL. All right, continuing along here on the Thursday edition of Locked on Kentucky, I guess is going to be the Thursday edition. Lance Daw hanging out here with you. Again, if you have not subscribed to the show already, would really appreciate it if you went ahead and did that if you're listening on podcast or on YouTube. And please let me know what you think about this game in the comments below. Are you upset about this one? Is this a is this a pushing point uh, or turning point for you with how you feel about this coaching staff? I know there are a lot of people really upset on Twitter last night. It's a loss at home to a team you beat on the road. Here are a couple of things that I think detail-wise are also important uh, in this game. Again, I want to highlight the fact that Florida was able to get those nine second chance points late. Kentucky had 16. That was a point of emphasis in the preview episode. Kentucky had to be able to capitalize on their offensive rebounds better than, uh, better than Florida did. And they were able to but not when it mattered. They were not able to close the game out after starting off strongly in that category. 17 offensive rebounds for Florida, 15 for the Wildcats. Nine of them, by the way, for UK, came from Uganda Onyenzo, who is the next player I want to highlight here. 16 total rebounds, 13 points, eight blocks. Unfortunately, four of 11 from the floor. I mean, if you're going to be able to get this guy touches... Um, he's got to be able to. He's got to be able to hit more consistently, especially if he's going to be operating that closely to the rim. Um, part of it, I think, may have to do with set design. Part of it may have to do with the fact that, oh gosh, this is something we talked about for months about how Hugo has been working on his offensive game for for the entire summer, and he was trying to improve, work on his floater, work on all these different things around the basket, his footwork, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, and maybe he just needs a little bit more time in a game, to actually get comfortable with that. Because, again, shooting sub 50% um, as a as a 7-footer is just usually not acceptable if, if, you're, if your bag consists of things that you can do around the, around the rim. Again, floaters and being able to do different bank shots and things inside the paint to kind of get you better positioning. You've got to be able to finish more consistently at the rim. And I understand that players like Tyree Samuel uh, for the Gators who had... 22 points on 9 of 21 shooting, and also 13 total rebounds and four four block shots, if I'm not mistaken. Um, guys like him, Alex Condone also. I mean, they, they've got some, Thomas Hall, they've got some big guys. They've got some big forwards on this team. Um, but Kentucky's got to be able to execute a little bit better, better than that. And they cashed in on second chance points, but again, not when it mattered. Um, something else that I thought was really interesting, despite Kentucky having a solid advantage, I think, in, in points in the paint, 42 to 34. Uh, Florida was still able to get 34 points in the paint. They were still able to go inside and finish, I think, more efficiently than they did in their first contest against the uh, the Wildcats. And Kentucky, as well, was also able to shoot significantly better from the floor than they did, if I'm not mistaken, compared to their first game. And Gainesville, both, the, both of these guys got, got more opportunities at two. And uh, the three-point shots fell, and it ended up being a higher-paced game. 
And Kentucky ended up losing, again, 29 lead changes. Kentucky held the lead for the most, of the most of the contest, by the way. Outside of that, there's not really anything special about, you know, fouls. Kentucky had 14. Florida had 17. Both these teams had 17 assists. They also had nine turnovers apiece and six steals apiece. Kentucky had 14 block shots. They could have done more with that. I think that this was a very... These two teams play very competitive, high-scoring games, as was proven in Gainesville. And Kentucky went 2 of 8 in overtime uh, from the floor. And uh, Florida was able to hit a really clutch 3 and made 5 free throws and closed it out. Kentucky didn't capitalize at the end of regulation, and that was that. Now, there are a couple of things that need to be said here about why this may not be, be the end of the world. There are also a couple things that may point toward this, towards this being bad. You would expect that a good Kentucky team will not make these types of mistakes in March. That the coaching staff will have the wherewithal to foul up three. That you hit those clutch free throws when you know if you don't win the game, you're going home. You don't have a dozen plus games left to play in the season. This is it. You hit your clutch free throws. You play better defense and you pay attention and you focus up and you try really, really hard. Not saying that Kentucky isn't. I'm saying maybe it's just an added level of urgency that you don't quite unlock in the regular season. Maybe those things happen for a good team in the NCAA tournament. And so when seeing results like this, you can view it as an opportunity to build an opportunity to learn, and an opportunity to move forward and be better. Or a bad Kentucky team will continue to make these mistakes, limp into the NCAA tournament. Now, by the way, at a 5-3 and record in conference play, could have been a really solid pickup here as a quad two win. Unfortunately, just not the case. Um, Limp into the NCAA tournament and get upset by a team that knows how to execute on your flaws while you're emotionally down and out. This, this offense has potential. This team has the potential to make a run in the tournament because of how good they are on offense. They also have a chance to get bounced in the first round if they don't wake up. A good Kentucky team closes these games out. A bad one doesn't. Let's see which one we see for the rest of the season, and let's see which one comes out in the NCAA tournament here in just a few weeks, which is crazy to think that it's, it's now just a few weeks away. You, you've got to have better production from your for, uh, front court players as well. I mean, that's a combined, what, 6 of 21? That, that's just, ooh. Mitchell going 0 of 5 from 3. I mean, even, even if you hit one of those, you hit one. You, you, the, game, the game's over. You win. It's just a, it was a tough contest against a team that plays you closely, as proven again in Gainesville, and you just didn't come out on top. And what did we talk about, and we'll talk about this a little bit more on tomorrow's show. What did we talk about on, the, I think, the second most recent episode of Locked On Kentucky? We talked about the fact that the Wildcats, the last time they made the national championship game, they were, they, they dealt with some similar issues during the regular season. They had a stretch there where they just kind of, didn't put things together. And now they've got a chance to wrap things up strong. They still do. they got a big game this Saturday against Tennessee. That's a huge opportunity. But they got to step up and win it. Three and three in their last contests. Last six contests are the Kentucky Wildcats. I don't know. Just a, just a, a missed opportunity is what it feels like. All right, that's going to do it for today's episode of Locked On Kentucky. You can follow the show on Twitter at Locked On UK. You can follow me on Twitter at Lance Dahl underscore, and you can follow the show over on Instagram. That is on at Kentucky Podcast. Any questions, comments, concerns, leave those in the YouTube comments below. Hit me on the socials. I will see you all tomorrow for another episode of Locked On Kentucky. Hope you guys have a great rest of your day, and God bless. God bless.